All right, well, all weekend, uh, our theme has been the idea of the church, and we've kind of been looking at these four questions. We kind of laid them out uh, yesterday. Um, the first one being what we answered yesterday of what is the church, kind of the structure, the doctrine, the, the eight distinctives um, specifically of our church. What does a healthy church look like? Uh, we also looked at uh, very, very briefly uh, the second question there of what is the mission of the church, uh, which we're going to study uh, t- this morning. Uh, talk later about the problem, church problems that are a big deal, and then tomorrow we'll talk about how to serve the church. But yesterday we had one slide on this question right here. Um, and what I really want to do is make sure that we spend an ample amount of time looking at really what the purpose of the church is. Because we can talk all day about the structure. We could talk all day about things going on at the church. Um, but specifically, if we don't know what the church um, is purpose to do, what the mission of the church is, um, then honestly, your time at church um, could be wasted. And, and that's not uh, what I want. So yesterday, we kind of went over this. Uh, you have it in your lecture notes uh, from uh, session one. Uh, but we looked at the mission of the church being threefold. The first one um, is, is, is that the church is all about exalting God. So this idea of upward, we have this uh, upward, inward, outward language here at our church. And specifically, our church is, some, is a church that is committed to going upward in all areas. Uh, one way that we do that is just through uh, the idea of, of worshiping in song, which is the reason that why we're in this room is so that the band can practice this morning so that they can go um, and uh, play excellently uh, tomorrow morning to lead us in worship, and that's an, a way for, for us as Christians to explicitly worship God and to glorify Him with our words, uh, with, our, uh, with our tongues. Um, so upward, all of our ministry events are really ultimately aimed at the glory of God, as we talked about yesterday. But also, uh, the second aspect of the mission of the church is to, is to equip the saints, and that's something that goes on here at church um, in sermons, that goes on in small groups, that goes on in the patio when people are just having conversations. Um, so here at our church, there is so much encouragement that goes on from one member to another member just by conversation, just by serving one another, by um, exercising their spiritual gifts, by having conversations. But then that last element of the mission of the church is to go outward. And that's the idea of evangelizing the lost, where we're not just only focused about the people that are here in this room. We're also focused on the people that are not in this room, that are outside the walls of these buildings, that we want to go out, talk to them, have conversations with them, so that they might uh, be able to uh, be saved as well. And so that's why we have things like the Evangelism Conference. That's why we do outreach events like Compass Carnival. That's why we're going to go out later this morning, and and we're going to uh, have conversations with people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord. And so here at our church, we're called to go upward, we're called to go inward, and we're called to go outward. And I thought it'd be good for us to open up to Colossians chapter 1, where we will see all three of these components play out in Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29 this morning. Colossians 1, 27 through 29, as we look at this threefold mission of the church to go upward, to go inward, and to go outward. Because if you, as a 13-year-old, as an 18-year-old, need to understand what we are doing at church or we are just sit here spinning our wheels. If you don't know why you go to school, if you don't know why you go to work, then it's not going to go very well. But if you have an end goal in mind, if you have a purpose and a mission to what you're doing, then there becomes much, the purpose becomes much more clear. So Colossians chapter one, let's look at verses 27 through 29 this morning. Colossians 1 Verse 27 through 29, we'll see all three of these elements of going up, in, and out through this ministry here of Paul. Verse, one, or verse 27, Colossians 1, 27 says this. It says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says, Him, referring to Christ, we proclaim warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ for this reason, or or, or for this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul here in these three verses, he describes his ministry to the church, uh, the, the Colossian church there. And looking at just a couple of verses above, it talks about how he's been suffering um, in, in, in doing ministry here at this church. It's been a sacrifice for him. But if you know anything about the book of Colossians, or really about any Christian, um, Gentile Christian in, in the New Testament, 
is most of them went from worshiping some other god, where they turned from worshiping maybe Greek gods or Roman gods, and now they've now shifted from worship of one set of gods to the one true God. And so, you know, in our day, you know, you go have a conversation with someone, evangelize someone, maybe they become a Christian. And a lot of people in our world today just have no religion, where they're, they're, uh, the word for them is nuns, N-O-N-E, where they're just, there's none, there's no religious affiliation, there's no religious convictions with what they believe. But back in these days, some, like 99% of people had a very strong religious conviction and structure. And so these Colossians, they were worshiping these false gods, and you see, you'd see them turn from false gods to the one true God to worship God only. And look at verse 27. It describes this this mystery of the gospel, which we talked about this a little bit in Ephesians chapter one when we were there. But he says that, Paul, he says that I I was doing this ministry because God, he chose to make known how uh, great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What he's saying here is that I'm going out doing ministry so that people might turn from false gods and turn to the one true God, and that they might be worshipers, correct, rightly ordered worshipers of the one true God. And really what he does here in this verse is he puts God on display where he says, God has been so kind to let these people know how um, big and how powerful, how great, how rich he is in glory. And so the first element of this ministry of Paul is to proclaim, verse 28, to proclaim him, to make Jesus known, to worship him even in conversations with other people. And so point number one, write it in this way as we think about this idea of upward. We need to get serious about putting God on display. That's what Paul was all about, was getting serious about putting God on display, making God the focal point, making God the object of people's worship. And again, in this text in this context, he's talking about his ministry to non-Christians, which we'll get to the outward in a minute. But if you take one step back and say, what is evangelism in a nutshell? Evangelism is getting people to see how incredible God is. Get them to turn away their gaze from their false idols, false gods, and to put their gaze and their worship on the one true God. Yesterday, we talked about the church being a group of people. Specifically, the term that we used yesterday was the people of God, where the church is is a distinct, it's a group of people with a distinct relationship to God, different than the rest of the world. We talked about how in the New Testament, that the people of God are now not just Jews, but also Gentiles. Anyone who believes in Jesus, they have a relationship with God. And we talked about the, the, the new covenant very, very briefly, but I wanted to look at it. Uh, Jeremiah 31, throw, throw it up on the screen. Jeremiah 31 verses 33 through 34 describes the people of God this way. God revealing himself so that people might see how powerful and rich and glorious God is. Jeremiah 31, 33 says this, for this is the covenant that I made with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each say to his neighbor or and each say to his brother, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The idea of the new covenant is the new covenant people of God see God as the object of their ultimate worship, of their obedience, of the, 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 the worship of their, of their lips, where we're singing songs about God, where he is the one that is on display. Both individually speaking, where you as a Christian, if you are a Christian, your goal is to glorify God. That is what you are designed to do. But also as a church, we are corporately, as a group together, we are all now called to glorify God with what we do, with our conversations, with our worship. And Paul here, he says that he's toiling, he's struggling, verse 29, with all of the energy that God has provided in him, that he powerfully works within him. Paul was pouring his life out for God because he was a slave of God. Romans 6, 22 says, you have been set free from sin and you've now become slaves of God. If you are a Christian, You are obviously, yes, you are part of the people of God, but individually speaking, you are now owned by God, where you are now called to everything that you are, everything that you do, put God on display, which means God demands your obedience. God demands submission to him. And so Paul, what he's doing is he's working hard so that people might see how powerful God is. 
Again, those three simple words. He says, him we proclaim. That is the content and the object of his conversations, of his proclamation to unbelievers, that they might see Jesus specifically, so that they might glorify God. And so this has a, a, an individual, like I just mentioned, an individual perspective of you as an individual. Everything that you do, you are a slave of God. Everything that you do is all in alignment, obedience, and submission to God because he is the one that saved you. You are no longer in control of your life. We see it play out in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So now glorify God in your body. Really what Paul is trying to explain here to a different church is that because God has purchased you as an individual, you no longer have the authority in your life to call your own shots. That's why we talk all the time. Whenever we're talking about the gospel and we say, hey, you need to become a Christian, and we'll always say the same idea, how we word it, it'll be a little bit different every time, the idea of you must give control to God of your life, where you're not you're not the one in control anymore because now God has bought you. He now calls the shots. You obey and you submit to him. You can't live like the rest of the world. Again, the word church, the ones who are called out of the rest of the world, living distinct, holy, submitting to a new master, not their old master. Let's think about it like this. In, in soccer, um, the, the way that Players go from team to team is a little bit different than other sports. Other sports, they will trade each other different different players. The, this good player and these two bad players or whatever, will, they'll trade they'll trade them to try to make it even for both teams. But in soccer, it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting, unique situation where soccer basically what happens is is everyone is free game. You can sign anyone that you want, no matter what. And so basically, what you have to do if you're a team is you can say, I want that person and I'm going to pay X number, hundreds of millions of dollars for that, for that person to now join my team. You could say 100 million, you could say 200 million, you could say 500 million. Doesn't matter. So basically, every person, every soccer player is a free agent. And so when a team comes in and says, I want this person, they, they agree on a fee of a certain amount, and now this person no longer has rights over themselves to just say, I, just, I, I want to play for whatever team I want. When this other team comes in and says, I'm going to pay $100 million for this person, you now have to go put on a new jersey because you have been bought by a team. You don't get to put on your old jersey anymore. You don't get to be the way that you used to be. You're now belonging to a new team. Same way for a Christian. If God has bought you, and so therefore you can no longer put on your old team's jerseys. And so when your new team says, hey, I want you to play five games a week and I want you to practice seven days a week. That's what you have to do because they own you. They are your boss now. And so in one sense, you're proclaiming him. You're putting God on display in your life, but then also corporately as a church, we're called to do the same thing. Ephesians 5, through 23, talking about husbands and wives, it gives this illustration of Jesus and the church, and it says this. It says, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Again, this is a conversation we'll get there later about husbands and wives. But it gives us illustration of the church's relationship to the church. That we corporately, as a group of people, we cannot just say, we're going to preach whatever doctrine, whatever, whatever we want to. We're going to start to talk about our own opinion. We don't have the authority to do that. And I'm not just saying me as a pastor, I'm saying us as Christians, as part of the church, the local church and the universal church. Now we are called to glorify God. Our worship matters. And so Paul, he identifies Christ as the object of his worship. You need to do the same thing. Uh, Psalm uh, 29 verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord glory. Do his name. Worship the Lord with splendor and holiness. One of the important aspects that we do here at our church is we are devoted to worship. Why? Because we like to sing? No. I mean, frankly, like, I, I don't like to sing at all. I, I, I frankly do not like singing at all. But you know what? Worship, it's completely different. I do like that. Why? Because it is, a, it is an opportunity for us as a church body to link arm in arm together and to make 
Jesus, make God, make the Holy Spirit even, the object of our praise and of our worship. That's a very significant thing. I want you to turn to Psalm 150. We'll see that play out in this psalm. Psalm 150, which is the last psalm. So if you flip to the middle of your Bible as you make it to Psalms, just flip until you see Proverbs. Very last psalm, six verses long. I hear this question asked before, is do I really have to worship? I don't like to sing. Some of you like to sing and worship is no big deal for you. Some of you don't. Do I have to do it? I want you to see this, Psalm 150 right here. Psalm 150, verse one. It says, super simply, very plain English, Psalm 150, verse one says, praise the Lord. That's a command there. That's not a, that's not a suggestion. That's not just a sentence. That is a command verb. It says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Now it talks about music. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with string and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise the Lord Uh, Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This psalm is telling you that you as a Christian, you have no choice in the matter. You are called. You must worship. I'm going to be really honest for a second. On Sunday mornings, it sounds like you're not. It, it doesn't sound like you're singing at all. Some of you are moving your mouths a little bit. I want, you, I want you to think of Psalm 150. Tomorrow when you show up to church, we're about to sing. You praise him with music. This is very important. Everything that has breath, if you are alive breathing, you must praise the Lord, verse 6 says. What do you praise him for? Verse two, for his mighty deeds, according to his excellent greatness, because God is good and because he has done good things, you are now obligated to worship him. You are being disobedient. When you stand here and don't worship, you are being disobedient. Which, that's, I mean, that's pretty intense. To be disobedient at church is, it would be a pretty big deal. You're commanded, you're obligated to do it in song, in word. Look at, look at the, the, the location even of verse one. Look at what it says. Where, where do you praise the Lord? It says, praise him in his sanctuary. Sanctuary is this idea of this sanctified, set-apart space where you come and worship him. Here at our church, we call that room over there the auditorium. This is just called the CSM room. But in many ways, it is a sanctuary in the sense that it is set apart. It is a different room than all the other rooms that you visit throughout the week where you get together and you worship God. Not as a suggestion, but as a command. So you need to get serious about your worship of God. And then likewise, you need to get serious about your obedience to God as well. John, uh, 1 John 5, 3 says this. It says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. You obey Jesus by worshiping him in song and you obey him in your actions as well. Serving, evangelism, your attitude, your words, your thoughts, all of those things. So getting serious about your worship and also your obedience, putting God on display. Again, if we're called out from the rest of the world, we're called out uniquely to worship God, proclaiming him as Paul describes here. In Colossians 1. But if you flip back to Colossians 1, let's continue on with what it says as we think about now going inward. What does Paul do? He's proclaiming Jesus. He's putting him on display, worshiping him. Read verse 28 with me again. Colossians 1, 28. It says, Him we proclaim. It says, Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now what Paul is doing is he's very serious about people growing in maturity and building up one another. Point number two, right on this way, the inward aspect of the mission of the church is this, get serious about building up one another. Get serious about building up one another. 
He says to do so, there's this warning and there's this teaching so that people show up mature on the other side. Get serious about building up one and one another. Get serious about each other's spiritual maturity. What is the idea of spiritual maturity? Well, the word maturity here is this idea of complete. This idea uh, also translated elsewhere in the Bible as the word perfect, where you are fully developed, fully formed, fully grown. And specifically, spiritual maturity is this. Uh, look at it. It says that we may present everyone mature in Christ. There is a, there is a future-focused um, idea of, of, of I'm looking forward to someone else being mature on judgment day where they are spiritually ready to meet God. Think about it like when you grow up, you know, when you're five years old, you know, your parents have different expectations for you than when you're 10 years old, than when you're 15, than when you're 18, and they're sending you off to college. What have they done from age one to age 18? They have hopefully prepared you more and more so that you are ready for college to be sent out into the world. That's the idea of maturity, being fully ready to be sent out. The idea of spiritual maturity is the idea that you are ready for that day in which you will meet God, that you are growing, that you are um, sanctified, that you're holy. And specifically the way that Paul does it, look at these two verbs here. It says that he warns everyone and he teaches everyone. Warning and teaching. The first word there of warning is this idea of confronting someone. This idea, uh, the word is admonish confronting, reproving, correcting someone, helping someone see that their life is not in perfect order and you're helping them get it into order is the idea of warning. So oftentimes the word warning has an aspect of sin to it. And again, if God has called you to be a part of the church, you are called out from the rest of the world, which means 1 Peter 1, 14 through 15, you are now called to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Do not look like you used to look when you were not a part of the church, the universal church. But it says, verse 15, but he who has called you is holy. You also now need to be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Sin in the church is a big deal. That's why repentance of sin is a big deal for a non-Christian, but also for a Christian each and every day that they're constantly repenting of sin, turning from it, being corrected by it from other people as well. Paul cares about the holiness and the purity of the church. I'm going to ask you a question. How much, genuinely, how much do you care about other people's sin? And what I mean by that is not how much do you care about pointing it out and making other people feel bad and being the one that confronts everything. I'm talking genuinely. How much do you care that other people around you sin against the holy God? Like you genuinely care for them and their soul. That's what this idea of admonishing and warning other people is saying. I care about other people's sin. You guys understand that you, as a, as a person here in CSM, that's not just for the leaders and the leaders, they care about your sin? They, they do. Well, they will call it out when you're out of line. But that's not just the leader's job. That should be your job, where you care about other people's sin here in this room so much so that you're willing to talk about it. Take a scenario for a moment, okay? So, I don't know. It could be at Go Weekend. It could be at church. It could be on Wednesday at small groups. You see someone else disrespecting a leader, maybe in a conversation, maybe a, a, an actual action. Do you care enough to have a conversation with them and say, hey, you know, that's, that's not something that we do. We need to not disrespect our leader. We need to submit to God and, and make sure that we honor our leaders or, you know, you hear someone gossiping at CSM. Do you step in and say, hey, let's order our conversations rightly with the Bible, how awkward of a conversation is that? Have you ever done that before? I've done that before. It's kind of awkward, right? Does, just because it's awkward, does that mean that you shouldn't have a conversation? No? Okay. The opposite of this is should you be the policeman that walks around and just points your finger at everyone and says, hey, stop it. Hey, stop it. Hey, stop it. I'm not saying that either. But again, what I, the question I just asked a moment ago is do you genuinely care about other people and their sin against a holy God? 
Therefore, you need to take small groups much more seriously. And frankly, some of you, some of you do not care about small groups. And some of you treat small groups like it's an actual joke. How do I know that? Because I've talked to your leaders. I have. I, I, frankly, I know who in this room treats small groups like an absolute joke. And there are people in this room right now, sitting here, I go weekend, that think small groups are a joke. They treat it like a joke. They don't care. They'd have way more fun in small groups, making their friends sitting next to them laugh at a joke that they're going to make to distract everyone else from the conversations that we're having about the Bible. And that's what you would rather do in a small group. And I want you to see how big of an actual deal that is when we line it up to what the mission of the church, both as an individual, but also corporately speaking, that ought not to be so. Like, I should not. I should not be getting reports from your leaders about how bad their small groups were and how much you've goofed off. And I don't care about how old you are. And again, I'll, I'll speak now. It's easier for high schoolers, for you guys to, to like properly be mature in small groups. But like talking to the junior hires now, stop goofing off. Like just stop it. Okay? As simple as that, just stop. Why? Because this is what the Bible says that the way that you should care about sin, the way that you should care about having conversations with other people, small groups are the avenue in which we do that. Take it more seriously. Because what we're doing in small groups is we're doing this very thing, warning everyone, helping everyone rightly order their lives in alignment with God's will. And then also, another element of that is teaching. Teaching is the idea of pr uh, presentation of truth aimed at spiritual growth. Helping people see how to, again, know how to live in accordance with God's will. Again, granted, yes, that is a, a very um, distinct role of a pastor. We talked about that yesterday as we looked at all of these different things, these different roles of what a pastor is. But that's also the role of every person here at the church as well. Every csm -er that you care about teaching. Maybe that doesn't look like you strapping a mic and walking up on stage and preaching a sermon, but it's you having conversations with people and just reminding them of the truths of God's word. Again, another question for you is how often do you talk about the Bible? How often do you talk about the things of God outside of small group time? Because I know how it is. It feels like I'm going to talk about God stuff like only in those 30, 40 minutes of small group time. And then when we're hanging out, like I'm never going to mention God because that's just kind of weird. Weird people bring up God and I'm not weird. So like, I'm just not going to talk about it. I'll talk about it in small groups, but nowhere else. That's not what this verse says. This verse says that we are constantly warning and teaching everyone. Again, I use this word in point number two of the word building up. And that's kind of the all-encompassing word of everything that we're doing. Talking about sin, talking about truth, talking about the Bible. We looked at this verse last night, but Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says our job is to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together is in the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. God has designed you to grow in spiritual maturity, in concert, in unison, in connection with other people. Therefore, your attendance, your commitment to small groups and church matters but then also the idea of building up one another, which is part of the reason why we are doing this Go Weekend. It's not just to spend a bunch of time together, but it's to build up our church. What we're gonna do later this afternoon is we're gonna go to multiple people from our church. I think the number is we're gonna go to 11, 12, 12 different families in our church today. Again, between all of you guys. 12 different families in our church and our goal today is to build them up. And I don't mean you're going to walk in and say, hey, what sin are you struggling with? Like, let's talk about it right now. That's probably not the tactic that I would recommend today when you go to a widow's house and you're, you know, you're there washing her car. I would probably not say that. But what you're doing by showing up, by being kind, by looking them in the eye, by being respectful, by saying, hey, I've never even met you before, but I care about you because you're a part of the church and I want to serve you. Let me wash your car. Let me pull the weeds out of your lawn or whatever you're, end up, whatever you're going to end up doing. What you are doing by serving people is you are building them up. You're encouraging them. You're doing this right here uh, of Hebrews 7. You're stirring them up where these people, they will show up to church tomorrow more encouraged and more stirred up to live for God because you showed up to them today. 
I, I, that's going to happen. I, I truly believe that. Therefore, we need to take our service very seriously. We're going to go to some people in the church that are suffering. Like I said, we're going to go to some widows' houses today, people that have lost their husbands. We're going to go, and we need to be kind to them. We need to be encouraging to them. We need to say, hey, we, we, we care for you. Hey, maybe let's pray for you. That would be a great conversation to have. We're going to go to some other people in the church that may not be suffering right now, but serve our church in so many ways where they put in hours and hours and hours every single week to serve our church or to serve CSM in some form or fashion. Show up with a smile. Hey, thank you so much for serving. I've never met you before, but thanks so much for all you do for the church. Just you having those types of conversation builds up other people, and we have an opportunity to do that today. Your presence makes a difference to them. You guys don't even get these, but like after Go Weekend last year, I got multiple letters from people to, to me that said, hey, thank you for sending your students to my house. And that's not for, for me to put on display and be like, oh, yeah, look at how great of an idea I had. No, no, I want you to see that and say, hey, there will be people who will write me letters after this weekend and say, man, I was so encouraged that a group of teenagers showed up to my house to encourage me. Make that your mindset today. It is, it is a privilege and an opportunity that you have for these 12 families to be built up and refreshed. When you see them at church tomorrow, they'll be excited to see you. Building up the body of Christ is what we're also called to do. But like I said, as we kind of zoom all the way out of this text, Paul is also talking about his ministry to unbelievers as well. He's sharing the gospel with people who do not know Jesus so that they might know Jesus and so this idea of proclaiming him is this idea of proclaiming the gospel to unbelievers. So point number three, we read it in this way. As we think about outward, point number three, get serious about reaching the lost. That's the third element of the ministry here and the mission of the church is that we need to be serious about reaching the lost. Again, the words here, it says warning everyone, teaching everyone, this idea that there is no distinction, that we need to be going and doing this not just inside the walls of our church, but also outside the walls of our church as well. Preaching the gospel to a world that needs to hear it. Talking about this, this idea of, of the, the mystery in verse 27, we don't really have time to, to look at that, but one text I do want you to see is Matthew 28. Matthew 28 is the, the, the ultimate mission, the evangelistic mission that God has given to us as members of the church. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We will be judged as individuals and as a church for how well we adhered, how well we followed that mission right there where we need to go out into our communities and say, hey, this is what it means to follow Jesus, to evangelize. Evangelize is literally the word gospel made into verb form, to gospelize someone, to present the gospel to them. That's what evangelism is. And evangelism probably doesn't come naturally to you. It doesn't really come naturally to many of us. Some of us it does. But to grow in your ability to evangelize is first and foremost, you, you've got to be praying for it. And so even before we go out, I want you to think, I want you to even spend just a couple moments to pray. Before we go out at, um, at uh, Veterans Sports Park, we're going to pray together. For high schoolers, you guys go out to the spectrum, you guys need to circle up and you need to pray together before you go out. Praying that you have compassion for the lost, praying that you will have conversations that will be honoring to God so praying for compassion, the second thing you need to do is, is, first of all, you need to know the gospel very well, which is why we've got those uh, little cards uh, specifically. I want to make sure that all of the high scores, you guys have those in your pocket. You're thinking about that as you go to the spectrum later today to go evangelize, to make sure that you know the good news, the bad news. Again, we've talked about this right here, the umbrella analogy before. But then after you pray, after you make sure that you understand the nuts and bolts of the gospel, then you need to just go out and get in the game. And we've got two opportunities to do that today. The first one being 
the Teltusten event. First thing that we're doing today is we are going out to Veterans Sports Park at 10 a.m. in about 30 minutes or so. We will be there. And all of those candy bags that you guys packed yesterday, we're going to split you guys up into groups of probably three or four. And you're going to go out, some of you, uh, a couple of you are going to go to the park, all of the people at the soccer games and uh, softball games. You're going to just walk up. If you see someone, you say, hey, I, I just, I've got a bag of candy here. I'd like to invite you. And so uh, some of you are going to go up to people at the park. But then some of you, most of you, are going to go, going to push you out into the neighborhood. And you guys are just going to pick a street, pick a lane, and you're just going to go right down those streets, and you're going to hit every door on those streets. And here's just to break down what I want you to do, the expectation for you, is you're going to go, most of you are going to go knock on doors with these candy bags. I want you to knock. I want you to wait for a couple seconds. Uh, you don't need to wait for like 30 seconds or anything. You just give it, you know, two seconds, three seconds or whatever. If someone comes to the door, great. If someone doesn't come to the door, then I just want you to put that bag of candy with the Compass Carnival flyer on their doorstep and then you can just walk away and hit the next house. But if they do answer, you can just say hi. You know, we're from Compass Bible Church, Tustin. We've got a big outreach on Halloween night from 5 to 8 at Veterans Sports Park right across the street here. Just wanted to invite you. Here's a little bag. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, join us there. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. That's really the expectation for you this morning when we go pass out these bags. It's not gospel. It's not evangelizing someone. It's not sitting down and talking about their sin with them. What I want you to do is just, I want you to invite these people to our church and to Compass Carnival. And again, the goal is you got to be kind. Don't be pushy. Don't be over the top. Like, um, yeah, just don't, don't, be, don't be super pushy. Just say, hey, here's a bag. Love to invite you. If they say, I don't want your candy, just say, okay, no problem. Have a nice day. Uh, you know, something very simple like that is what I want you to do at the uh, Teletussin Outreach. But high schoolers, we're going to go out and we're going to take that one step farther. We're going to go to the spectrum and we're going to share the gospel. Junior hires, you guys will go to a house during this time. But high schoolers at the spectrum, what I want you to do is break up into groups of three or four people, uh, some girls and some guys. And I want you to go out and to look specifically for teenagers that you see out at the spectrum. Again, you can talk to old men, but I would, I would say probably keep it teenagers. Um, if they're in college, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but look for people around your age. And I want you to walk up to them and I want you to just say, hey, you know, my name is Matt, and uh, I'm from Compass Bible Church, and we we're just out here asking some people some conversations about Jesus, and we we're just curious. Like, what do you think, or uh, do you have any beliefs about God, or do you have any beliefs about Jesus, or do you have any beliefs about the Bible, or do you have any religious beliefs, something along those lines to get a conversation going in the spiritual realm? And you just, you just say, hey, we're out here having conversations, asking some people some questions about what they think about God, or what they think about the Bible. And then we'll have some CSM flyers over here on your way out. Make sure uh, your, le your leaders will have those in their car. Just make sure you've got a couple in your pocket. You have conversations. You share the gospel. Make sure you've got one of those umbrella analogy uh, cards as well. Um, please don't have that out and read off it like a, like a teleprompter when you're there. Um, know it. Think about it. Look at it on your way on the drive over there. Again, we've talked about the gospel so many times. You should know it uh, pretty well. Uh, but have a conversation about the Bible, about God, about the good news of the gospel. Invite them to CSM. If it's not super weird, you can ask for their contact info and say, hey, love to see you on, uh, you know, on Sunday or on Wednesday or something like that. But our opportunity today is to go outward in an invite way at Teltussin and then outward in an evangelism way at the Spectrum. And we're going to go out. We're going to have conversations. We're going to try to live out this mission of the church for us to go upward, to go inward, and to go outward, to reach the lost with the gospel. Again, specifically the words of Jesus is to go therefore make disciples of all nations. And that's what we'll have a chance to do in a couple of minutes. So let's pray right now, and then we'll uh, break off into cars, and then we will head out uh, to our first event of the day. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, thank you so much uh, for the uh, purpose of the church, God, given uh, pretty, uh, very, very cleanly to us um, in your word. Uh, that we're called to worship you and glorify you, we're called to, to build up one another and to encourage one another. 
um, and called to go out into our communities and, and make a difference for your name uh, with the gospel. And so, God, I do pray today as we do all three of those things. God, may you give us strength and boldness to do them. God, specifically, I think about evangelism. I know that can be intimidating, but God, I pray that you give every student in this room boldness to have conversations, to invite people, uh, to talk about the gospel um, at, at the spectrum. And God, may you use the efforts that we, that we, um, that we do today to, uh, to, to bring yourself um, maximum glory because you deserve it. Um, so God, thank you so much for uh, this morning to talk about these things. Pray just give us a great time now as we go to go out, um, to go outward uh, in a couple minutes. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.